Good afternoon, it's Thursday, December 31. I'm Giovanni Dennis with the final midday news for 2020. A special welcome if you're joining us online at onespotmedia.com. There's a strong warning this afternoon to party promoters, particularly those in Clarendon, Manchester and St. Elizabeth, to desist from hosting events or parties that are in breach of the Disaster Risk Management Act. It comes from Assistant Commissioner of Police in charge of Area 3, Michael Smith. Now the warning comes on the heels of concerns raised by members of the Divisional Intelligence Unit about an event to be held in St. Elizabeth tonight between the hours of midnight and 7 a.m. Friday, January 1. The event, which is being promoted by a popular dancehall entertainer, is also being widely circulated on social media. ACP Smith says the event for which no permit was issued would clearly be in breach of the DRMA. Now, patrons who intend to attend this event are also being warned not to, as they too would be prosecuted when caught. The St. Elizabeth Police is reporting that a summons has been issued for the arrest of popular entertainer Beaneman for a party held in the parish last month. The warning comes as said entertainer is promoting another party slated for today. Now, head of the St. Elizabeth Police Deputy Superintendent Narda Sims says that will not be allowed. Four persons were last night arrested in St. Thomas for breaches of the Disaster Risk Management Act following an operation in Notch River in the parish. Now, according to police reports, between 9.40 and 10.30 p.m., a team of officers visited the community where an illegal event was in full swing. Approximately 250 patrons were in attendance. A number of persons dispersed on the approach of the police. The promoter of the party, a businesswoman from Morant Bay, was arrested and three men, one of a Virginia United States address and two from St. Thomas were also arrested. A pregnant woman who was also at the location and another man were warned for prosecution. The police seized sound system equipment during the operation. Jamaica's COVID-19 case count has increased to 12,827. 34 new cases were confirmed on Thursday. Their ages range from 2 to 87 years. Westmoreland and St. Anne recorded majority of the new cases, followed by St. James. Meanwhile, the country's COVID-19 death toll remains at 302. The health ministry says 84 patients remain hospitalized with the respiratory illness. Eight are critically ill. Businesses in Westmoreland are booming despite tighter curfew hours in the parish. That's according to the Negril Chamber of Commerce. However, President of the Chamber, Richard Wallace, is disappointed that the curfew hours were extended instead of being relaxed. Westmoreland has been under tighter restrictions since December 16 due to a spike in COVID-19 cases. A move that President of the Negril Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Richard Wallace, thought would have had a devastating impact on the business sector in the parish. But he said business has picked up, especially since Christmas Day. After Christmas, that weekend, Friday, Saturday, Boxing Day, that weekend, we saw an uptick in business. Even now, up to now, we are still experiencing a, a boom, a little boom. We don't know how long it will last. Negril is buzzing right now. We have um, New Year's Eve and most of the hotels are, are booked. And um, a lot of it is Jamaicans too. But, you know, as you, you probably heard, December had the highest number of, of arrivals in Jamaica. What we've noticed is a lot of Jamaicans came home for the, for the holiday as well. So, and they're going on out and about and enjoying, you know, our beautiful country. So, so it's good. Mr. Wallace adds that most hotels in Negril are now full for the New Year holiday. Now, the early nightly curfew was extended yesterday. A release from the Office of the Prime Minister stated that the curfews from 7 o'clock at night until 5 o'clock in the mornings will continue until January 15. Mr. Wallace says he was hoping that the curfew would not be extended, but in spite of the announcement, he says businesses will continue to comply. I'm just learning that the curfew was, was extended. The shorter hours were extended to January 15. I mean, I, I think there are some improvements in what's happening around. People have been obeying the, per, the curfew to date, especially in the grill. I, I know that by 8 o'clock, you know, everywhere is closed down and the place is deserted. So we, 
we were kind of hoping that it would have it would not have been renewed, but you know another two weeks won't kill us, so we will have to abide by it and um, and hope that the numbers will go down. According to the office of the Prime Minister, Westmoreland has the highest number of cases per one hundred thousand of the population. Up to yesterday, the parish had recorded six hundred and seventy five coronavirus cases. Oshade Masters, TVJ News. The Jamaica Federation of Corrections has reacted strongly to reports about alleged abuse of prisoners by correctional officers. The union, which represents warders, is asserting that it's prepared to defend its members against any legal action for doing their duties. O'Shane Masters reports. Chairman of the Jamaica Federation of Corrections, Arlington Turner, has taken issue with public statements being made by a human rights group Stand Up Jamaica and is seeking to refute claims of abuse. Executive Director of Stand Up for Jamaica, Carla Goletta, reported yesterday that the group was contemplating legal action on behalf of inmates at the St. Catherine Adult Correctional Center who have alleged being abused. The allegations are that while conducting searches, the officers have used excessive force. Those allegations have been flatly denied by Mr. Turner. Absolutely no. We have not gotten the report in regards to abuse. The fact still remains that we must, persons must understand that we are the custodian. When we carry out searches such as this, if an inmate behaves in a particular manner, then we have to take control. So there is no abuse taking place. I will refute that again. Therefore, what we are saying is that when the words come in how to say issues are happening to inmates in a negative way, we need to be very careful what we are doing here. We are in charge and we will continue to be in charge. Mr. Turner also addressed the issue of how searches are being conducted by correctional officers. I am now hearing that the Stand Up Jamaica is now saying searches are carried out in the wee hours of the morning. No one dictates to correctional officers how we search our prisons. So I want to really refute the issue. I think it is sad that we have stakeholders who really speak in these manners when they don't understand how the prisons are operating. We carry out search anytime. So I want to just make that very clear. When we search our prisons, there are certain things that need to take place. Therefore, we cannot allow a prison to run with the prisoners in control. Mr. Turner says he's confident that his members have nothing to fear as it relates to legal action. We will defend our members in regards to how they carry out their duties in lawful manner. Anyone can say they are going to take legal action. We have no problem with that. But take legal action against what? And against whom? So we have to be very careful how we talk about legal action. But we are prepared to stand by our correctional officers. The courts send these people to us to be in our care until the time comes for them to go. They are prisoners. We are custodians, and we will continue to be in charge. Prisoners will never be in charge of our prisons. The matter has also attracted the attention of the Independent Commission of Investigations, Indicom, which has commenced a probe into the allegations. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. And it's now time for a break here on the Midday News, but please stay with us. We'll have much more when you return. Welcome back and we're continuing the news. Opposition spokesperson on education Dr. Angela Brown Burke has joined the Jamaica Teachers Association in questioning the move by the Education Ministry to cut additional staffing support for schools for the academic year 2020-2021. Prince Moore reports. According to the Ministry of Education, temporary staff for schools would not be needed after today, December 31. The decision was made after the reopening of schools did not go as planned due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Jamaica Teachers Association, JTA, had said it disagrees with the move and now opposition spokesperson on education Dr. Angela Brown-Burke has taken sides with the JTA. Dr. Brown-Burke believes the move comes at a time 
when the schools will need even more support. The question that really needs to be asked is, by now, one would have expected the Ministry of Education to be knee-deep, almost completed, in terms of a plan to bridge the divide that exists, to recover the loss of learning that we have experienced thus far. And for that, we are going to need a lot more teaching support staff than we currently have. And that is something that the Ministry of Education, along with our schools, need to be engaged in to ensure that come January 2021, for those who are going virtual, there is a greater chance of ensuring that um, learning takes place at the level that we want it to take place. And for those who are doing face-to-face, -face, that they too are able to do it. She argues that the ministry should have done an assessment before making a decision. Um, I think that by now the Minister should have made an assessment to say okay these ancillary workers we may not need based on the number of schools that are going um, not going to be doing face-to-face -face. and in these instances we need them because these schools are going face-to-face -face. and then they should also by now have made an assessment about the additional teaching support that's going to be required to deal with almost an entire year of loss of learning in so many many of our schools and I believe that the time is now for them to tell us what they have been looking at reviewing and what is to happen come next week. Prince Moore, TVJ News. Family members of 20-year-old Akeem Ray are awaiting DNA evidence to find out if a partially decomposed body which was found yesterday is that of their relative. Ray, a student of the University of Technology, went missing on Friday, December 4. It's understood that Ray was at home when he told a relative that he was going on the road to conduct business. However, he did not return. Head of the St. Anne Police, Superintendent Carlos Russell, says the body was found in Alexandria on December 17. Rahim Vickers, 20 years old, also of the Bethany district. He has been charged for the offence of murder and is to face the court in short order. Superintendent Russell says concern is now growing regarding the level of crime in the parish and more so the types of crime now being committed. Based on our intelligence, um, we are seeing where large scammers are, are moving into the parish, um, especially in the Brownstown and Alexandria area. And um, we know what comes with these persons. Um, wherever these um, persons operate, there is always a high level of of crime and violence. So we do not want them here in St. Anne. So we have already started to put plans in motion. We are working with our proactive investigation team and also with our outside partners, the Latter Scam Task Force, to mount operations against them and to, to target them. At least one public sector union is calling for transparency in wage talks with the government. President General of the Bustamante Industrial Trade Union, Kevin Gale, says the government needs to state clearly their plans for workers when the new round of wage talks begins in 2021. Mr. Gale says there are several factors which must be taken into consideration, especially the financial limitations caused by the coronavirus pandemic. He was speaking this morning on TVJ Smile Jamaica. Based on past experience and the consultations with the, not only the Minister of Finance, but also his team and those who lead the negotiations, they have been reasonable in the discussions. I can't say that we will be confident enough to get what our desires are, but I would anticipate that the government sitting across the table would be fair and reasonable. One of the things that is, would be all of its public sector salary review, he says it's critical that unions get the information ahead of the start of the new wage talks as a result of public sector salary will form part of the negotiations. We anticipate and expect that the outcome of such review would be presented to us so that we would know what we are up against um, and what it would entail. 
And that would also inform us in treating with the preparations of the negotiations going forward. Mm -hmm. And also, coming out of that, whatever the results would have been, the government would have to determine how they intend to treat with it, how they intend to treat with the question of impl implementation. The public sector salary review should have been completed this month. The review is aimed at restructuring the compensation systems in the public sector. The St. Mary police are reporting that 500 motor vehicle accidents occurred in the parish this year. There were 18 fatal accidents and 22 fatalities. The areas of Prospect along the Prospect Main Road, the Arakabesa that stretch, Boscobel stretch and along Galena, and in the Dover Itiboreal areas of St. Mary, those are really bad spots that we have had very tragic accidents. Now, superintendent in charge of the St. Mary Police, Bobbitt Morgan Simpson, says it's worrying. She's calling on motorists to exercise caution when using the roadways. This is a small parish, and it is really a tragedy that we can have so many fatalities and so many accidents happening on our roads. The police are on the road, and we are doing our road policing, and we're ensuring that we apprehend those speed persons, those motorists, those motorists who are speeding unnecessarily on, on the roads. To news overseas now, UK health officials have approved the use of the new AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine amid a pandemic surge and a new variant. The vaccine brings hope as three quarters of England have been put in a tier four lockdown. Details from the CNN. The authorization of this vaccine is considered hugely significant because it is robust and transportable. It doesn't need to be stored at ultra low temperatures. A fridge will do. That logistical convenience means that it can be moved around easily and rolled out widely. To make the most of its potential, the government is switching tactics. Instead of focusing on getting two doses of the vaccine to people, it's going to prioritize stock as it becomes available on getting the first dose to as many people as possible as quickly as possible to build up a level of immunity in a wide section of the population. The hope is that will reduce severe infections, save lives and ease pressure on distressed hospitals. The government is confident this is a game changer, so much so it says it will help end the pandemic in this country and it says that could happen as early as spring. But to achieve that, the vaccination program will have to be ramped up significantly. It is welcome news, inspiring some hope in what is otherwise a very dark time in the United Kingdom when cases are soaring and threatening to overwhelm parts of the health system. In sports, noted medical expert Dr. Carl Bruce has urged teams to add members to their staff to deal specifically with COVID-19 compliance heading into the 2021 local track and field calendar. As Jordan Fort reports, the noted health expert also said that there should be a zero-tolerance approach to non-compliance with COVID-19 protocols. The local track and field season is expected to heat up in early 2021 as juniors get ready for the ISA Boys and Girls Championships and seniors prepare for the Olympics. But as development meets are set to come thick and fast early next year, Medical Chief of Staff at the University Hospital of the West Indies, Dr. Carl Bruce, says he is strongly suggesting that teams add extra support personnel to help with COVID-19 compliance. The organizing committee should have a compliance officer and a team to ensure that they are monitoring and that that everyone is adhering to procedure. But what I'm also recommending is that each team have an adult individual who is assigned the role of their compliance officer. And therefore, the organizing committee compliance officer and team can then go to that officer to ensure that anything that is not working out well can be done. Dr. Bruce also says that the protocols must be strictly enforced to minimize risk. As such, President of the Jamaica Track and Field Coaches Association, David Riley, says one person from a team being in breach of protocols may cause an entire team to be denied entry to a meet. The same thing if you, if you have a car person show up, you know, trying to get in. 
and one person in that car is found to have an elevated temperature. The end, all of them should be denied entry. That's the whole idea. It's a, it's a method of transportation. So if the individual comes and the individual is found to be elevated temperature, then you, you turn back everybody. With plans afoot to have more meats spread across the country, J3A's treasurer and chief starter Ludlow Watts says additional officials are being trained in order to staff the extra events. But I also stated that we have th three trainees who should join the staff that the regular starting group properly in a strong capacity in terms of competence and training next year. And by, by two years time, we'll have them fully fledged starters. So we are continuing to increase the, the complement. Watts, Riley and Bruce were speaking recently at the J3's virtual calendar conference. Jordan Fort, TVJ Sports. And that's the Midday News. I'm Giovanni Dennis on behalf of the entire team. Good afternoon.